Well, good morning and welcome to Grace Harvest Baptist Church on this Sunday as we come to worship our risen Savior. And also here we celebrate Father's Day today. Um, before we go any further, there's baby bottles in the back. Uh, um, again, those are uh, to be filled with coins as you feel led to help the Crisis Pregnancy Center here in Amelia and our surrounding counties. Uh, we'll be taking those up till the end of the month. Um, I do want to mention something. Um, some people are, are aware of this. Uh, you may not uh, have heard yet in the news, but as you all know, we have a, a team in Uganda in central Uganda at SOS Ministries, um, Elder Brian and his wife Wanda and uh, Jenny and uh, also Anella. And they're there and, and uh, our representatives and been having a great time. If you're friends of Anella on Facebook, you can see she's posted pictures every day that she's been there. But there was an attack of a Christian school. A uh, Muslim terrorist killed a bunch of children, macheted them, and um, burnt them. And it was on the border with, Conda, with the Congo and Rwanda, which is about um, six or seven hours away. And it would more than likely, it's like our distance from here to New York City. And in Uganda, that's, that's light years, basically. So they're not in any danger. But again, you've got to remember that this is a, this is a volatile country, uh, Uganda is. Any nation in the world is where you have extremists that want to shut down the gospel of Jesus Christ. So be, be in prayer for, for those that are affected personally by that. Um, you can imagine having your children in a boarding school and an attack just because of their faith. And, um, but our, our team is, is safe, and at SOS Ministries, they do have security as well. And the one thing about SOS Ministries is they've come in there, and they have children now from uh, kindergarten through t uh, 10th grade in their school system. Uh, Anella got the chance to visit with one of her sponsored children, and the child rides his bicycle seven miles a day just to go to school. And we're not talking about roads like we have. We're talking about roads that are – they and I've been on these roads. <laughs> it took them 30 minutes by vehicle to go those seven miles. And so um, it is uh, – it, it's just a reminder of what people go through. And uh, one of our sponsored children even lived two miles further than that. And these children ride their bikes to get there. And the community has fallen in love with SOS Ministries. And so imagine you would uh, uh, this uh, a circle and everything around it, expanded of it. SOS Ministries has their hand in almost everything, employment for people, opportunities for people. So they're well loved in the community they're in. But continue to pray uh, for our team as they're away and SOS Ministries with Dr. Shannon Hurley. He will be here in October. For those who have never met him and his wife, Danielle, you're in for a treat. Uh, he is he is a um, very vivacious individual who loves the Lord and been in Uganda for over 20 years. So this morning, uh, as we celebrate Father's Day, I, I want to encourage you men and you fathers, but ladies, don't think you can just shut it off this morning and don't think you can't get anything out of this because a lot of this will pertain to all of us as believers. But specifically, I'm going to be talking about men, men who are fathers, men who may become fathers, men who have grown children and you are grandfathers now, um, and to men that don't have children. All of this, will, you will see, pertains to us as believers. I want to share with you some, some disturbing statistics about um, fatherless homes. 85% of youth who are currently in prison grew up in a fatherless home. Seven out of ten youth that are housed in state-operated correctional facilities, including detention and residential treatment, comes from a fatherless home. Thirty-nine percent of students in the United States from the first grade to their senior year of high school do not have a father at home. Children without a father are four times more likely to live in poverty than children with a father. Children from fatherless homes are twice as likely to drop out of school before graduating than children who have a father in their home. 24.7 million children in the United States live in a home where the biological father is not present. That equates to one in every three children in the United States not having access to their father. Children who live in single-parent homes are more than two times more likely to commit suicide than children living in two-parent homes. 72% of Americans believe that a fatherless home is the most significant social problem and family problem that is facing their country. You know, we're pretty much divided on almost every issue 50-50. But do you notice on this one issue, 
everybody is almost everybody is in agreement at least the vast majority that this is an issue Si- only 68% of children will spend the entire chi- childhood in an intact f- family. And so you've got to realize that it is not good here in this country when we look at the statistics. And so we are called to be different than the world, men. To be fathers that are, that are dedicated to the God that we serve and to the sons and daughters that we raise. We're going to stand and honor the reading of God's Word. One short verse today, 1 Corinthians chapter 16, verse 13. So if you'd stand with me as we honor the reading of God's Word. One short verse, 1 Corinthians chapter 16, verse 13. Be watchful. Stand firm in the faith. Act like men. Be strong. Father, you... Proclaim these words to the Apostle Paul for us to hear. And just as it pertained to the church in Corinth some 2,000 years ago, it pertains to every believer that lives and will ever live. And so, Father, this morning I pray that this sermon that you have laid upon my heart would be an encouragement to fathers gathered here and listening online. That, Father, it would be cause for correction where they see themselves falling short in the areas that you prescribe that we should exhibit as godly fathers. Father, may it convict us for falling short and seeking your forgiveness. Lord, may you receive the honor and glory for what is proclaimed here this day. And Father, may we witness a modern day miracle. May we see man, woman, young person, Come to saving faith in Christ. And may you receive the glory for it. In Jesus' precious name, amen. You may be seated. Thank you. You know, as we live in a world that offers conflicting views of what being a man is all about, we're bombarded with it. Some say that being a man requires grit and a square jaw determination, a working knowledge of weaponry, and and preferably to have rock-solid abs. That's what some view as, as a, being a man. I know when I grew up, you know, uh, men were men, and you were taught as a, a young boy to, to emulate that and, and to be a man. Others say that manliness is about getting in touch with one's feelings, caring for the less fortunate and being sensitive. And still others would include leadership skills, a good work ethic, physical stature, riches, or sexual prowess. Can these things truly that I've described to you define masculinity, or is there another standard? Hollywood and woke culture have done everything they can to destroy the biblical roles for men and for women. From the late 1960s, the women liberation movement has de- declared to women that they cannot be, feel, be fulfilled by being a mere wife and mother. You need a career, the ladies were told in the late 60s and early 70s. In 1966, women made up 14% of the professional workforce. Now it's 51%. Men are portrayed as weak, dumb, or both. In one recent adventure movie, the writers purposely made the two female characters do all the fighting with the males look like bumbling fools. And that is hardly the exception nowadays when you look at modern cinema. Cinema. Disney movies for decades have produced movies that make women smarter, stronger, and braver than any of the male leads. We live in a world that has emasculated men. Men are told that being a traditional man is toxic. And God did not create men and women the same. We have different roles within a God-ordained relationship. Early studies on gender and happiness found men and women were socialized to express different emotions. Women are more likely to express happiness, warmth, and fear, which helps with social bonding and appears more consistent with the traditional role as a primary caregiver. Whereas men display more anger, pride, and contempt, which is more consistent as the protector and provider role. I can remember when we brought Crystal home and... uh, we, we got her home, and, and for days I just stare at her. Wouldn't say anything to her, just kind of look at her. And my wife would graciously look at me and say, Honey, talk to her. 
And I'm like, why? <laughs> she can't respond. She can't do anything. I tell you what, give her back to me when she can throw a baseball. And then we'll, <laughs> and then we'll do something. Or she can play with me. Or she can do that stuff. You know, as a man, I just, it was like, uh, it was a baby. Like, here, it cries. You take it. We're wired differently. Men are wired differently. Men are the protector. Women are the nurturer. It, you can't, this is what God has ordained. But it's even worse when we think about when people say there is no difference between men and women. What once was looked upon as a mental illness is now promoted and celebrated. I want to share something. It was just a shock to me, and I knew it hadn't been that long ago, but I thought it was a whole lot longer than it is. Did you know that until two, 2012, so just 11 years ago, men declaring they were women and women declaring they we were men, it was considered a mental disorder. Okay, that's just 11 years ago. We're not talking about 20, 30, 40, 50 years ago, like something came out of the 60s and said, you know, it's not like one of those commercials where you see um, the nurse offering the patient in the, in the uh, recovery room a cigarette, right? We've all seen those things, right? You know, they offer cigarettes to people that are recovering in a hospital, something we would never even think about. We know that that's not the way. But just 11 years ago, professionals, not Christians, the professional mental community said it was disorder. Let me... Let me read to you a quote. This was from shortly after they changed this. So in the year 2012, shortly after they changed their decision. And one report read this. Quote, the American Psychiatric Association has re revised its diagnostic, diagnostic and statistical manual of mental disorders, and it is no longer lists being transgender as a mental disorder. Among other changes announced this past weekend, transgender people will now be diagnosed with gender dysphoria which means emotionally stressed related to gender identity. Gender identity disorder has been listed as a mental disorder since the third edition of the DSM more than 20 years ago, unquote. So at the turn of the century, they labeled it as a disorder, and then because they weren't on the right side of wokeness, you had to change what the medical profession said. We're in a sad state of affairs. Now men declare they're women, and they will have surgery to move parts of their body. I said this in the earlier service, and Crystal came up to me and said, Dad, you threw me under the bus. Well, I'm going to throw you under the bus on live television now, Crystal. If I had given in to every desire that Crystal had as a 12- and 13-year-old girl, she wouldn't be alive today. Can you imagine that you as a parent would have an 8, 9, 10-year-old child who one day thought he was going to be a doctor or then a dinosaur, come and tell you that they don't like the gender they are. And then you would go to a professional and get puberty blockers that they have no clue what the long-term effects of these uh, things are or actually mutilate their child's body. I, I, it's beyond my imagination. And then the states that are standing up to this bullying and making laws prohibiting somebody from doing this to an underage person, they're called bigots and, and transphobic and all this other nonsense when all they're trying to do is protect a, a child from their parent. Here's another study that's been making the rounds that was reported years ago, and it's just come recently back out. Some of you may have seen this. But it said that over, over half of the people that suffer from this issue of thinking they're a man when they're a woman or a woman when they're a man come from families where their mother has a mental disorder, over 50%. Frightening, isn't it? And yet, and yet the world will tell you that there's something wrong with you as Christians for standing up to this. It's, it is beyond comprehension that we live in a society that has turned the genders not only upside down, but now want to switch. With all the confusion in the world today, I will remind you that our God is not the author of confusion. He is the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow. And so this morning, as we look at what God says about being a man, we see that God 
through Paul, gives us four imperatives to be a man. Men, pay attention. He says, be watchful. Stand firm in the faith. Act like men. And be strong. Ladies, three of these four points apply to you as well. Be watchful. Stand firm. Be strong. Be watchful. It means to be awake, to be, to be on guard, to stand guard. Paul wrote to the church in Thessalonica, so then let us not sleep as others do, but let us be awake and sober, 1 Thessalonians 5, 6. Be awake. Be sober. Picture a watch guard at a city gate or on a city wall. Why does he stand there? Why, what, what is he watching for? You, it may come to mind some of the movies that you've seen in the past that depict a castle or a fortress some 2,000 years ago, and, and you can see that watchman holding his spear and his shield, and, he, and he's walking to and fro on the wall. What is he looking for? For one thing, he might, there might be an army that's coming to attack the city, and he needs to give a warning if he sees an army coming from the distance. Another reason to stand watch on the city walls is that there might be a spy trying to gain entry into the city, and he must stand watch over that, be on guard of that, so he doesn't slip into the city to cause mischief. And finally, a guard must stand watch at all times because a messenger might come with important news for the people in the city. So too, in the Christian life, men, we, we must stand watch. We must be ready. The term is used 22 times in the New Testament, often in reference to Christians being spiritually awake and alert as opposed to being spiritually lazy and indifferent. You see, if you're honest with yourself, you notice when, when things don't go well in your life spiritually, when you're in a lull, it's because you have become lazy and indifferent to the things of God. They, 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 are, they are not primary concerns in your life anymore. Things get in the way. Whether it's sports, whether it's recreation, whether it's a hobby, whether it's your children, whether it's work, whatever it is, it gets in the way, and, and God, be, you become spiritually lazy. And fathers, I, I would encourage you to watch for six threats that we see in Scripture. I'm going to give you six threats to be watchful for. The first threat is Satan. We are to be on the alert against Satan. First Peter. Chapter 5, 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 8. Be of sober spirit, be on the alert. Your adversary the devil prowls about like a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour, but resist him firm in your faith. You see, picture the, again the Serengeti when you see the water buffalo or the wildebeest in their great migration. And you see them in their herds, and they're protected. The lions just kind of sit over in the grass watching as these herds go by. They, they can't attack the herd. Who do they attack? They attack the weak. They attack the ones outside the herd. And when you're outside the body of Christ, when you're outside of church fellowship, when you're outside of a Bible-believing church like Grace Harvest, where God has placed elders spiritually to watch over your soul, not to lord over you and tell you what house to buy, what car to drive. No, as God puts elders over to be watch care of your soul, to teach the truth of Scripture, to encourage you and to correct you, when you're outside of that, when you're outside the fellowship of the body, when you don't have brothers and sisters in Christ to hold up your arms, when you're depressed and tired and weary, when things go wrong, when you don't have that, you have the body of Christ there to help you. You are like that wildebeest on the edge of the herd limping. And Satan is like that lion waiting, waiting to devour. And do you know how Satan can attack you? He attacks us through the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the, and the boastful pride of life, First John 2.16 tells us. The apostle writes that. The lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the boastfulness pride of life. The lust of the flesh. When fleshly desires rule us, taking priority over God's will, they cause us to violate God's righteousness. They become lust. You know, we always think of sex as a lust, but we can have lust for things like food. For example, when hunger propels us to find food, eating is good. There's nothing wrong with that. It's not a sin. Jesus said, he, Jesus ate and drank and when, he was, when he was on here on the earth, but when hunger becomes a lust, 
for food, it turns into gluttony, which is a sin. Proverbs chapter 23, verse 20 tells us that. When natural sexual desires turn perverse, they lead to homosexuality, adultery, fornication, and other sexually related sins. Marriage is to be honored and protected, men. Are you protecting yourself? Are you watching for those things? You see, the enemy will try to come in and tell you as a husband that, that, that you can't possibly think one woman can satisfy you. My wife and I will be coming next weekend. We will spend, this will be our 46th wedding anniversary. And I tell you right now, I am thankful for God that he has given me a woman that I can love, I can cherish, I can nurture, and she is by my side. And that God has allowed us, yes, even 46 years, 46 years later, to be intimate with one another. He has blessed us with that. It's not, it's not something to be ashamed of, Christian, but it's something to be remain in the confines of the marriage. And the, what does Satan do? He comes in and says, that's not enough. That can't be enough. And so, young person, be, be very, be very, very wary of those voices that's, that sp speak in your head. Young people, young men, young men, remain pure. Young women, remain pure. The world will tell you not to. But God's word is clear. And even if you're an unbeliever this morning, listen to my counsel, just as a man who has lived a life of 66 years, 29 years in police work, 17 years as a pastor. I can tell you right now that when people disobey God, even unbelievers, there's consequences for those actions. And to Listen to mom and dad when they tell you. They're not telling you because they want to be mean. They're not saying things to you like they want to control your life. What they're trying to tell you is they want to protect you and nurture you so that you have that relationship one day that is special. But we have the lust of the flesh, and the lust of the eyes occurs when we see something visual that incites covetousness, jealousy, or sexual lust. Dad, father, husband, do you protect yourself, your wife, your children? Do you protect yourself what you see, what you let your wife watch on when you are together, what your children view? Are you there to protect them, Dad, or do you just don't care? The pride of life is the desire in every human being to be his or her own God. Desires of the flesh, desires, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life. Satan knows how to use these things against us. And every human being is the desire to be your own God, bottom line. Arrogance, self-promotion, greed, all stem from the pride of life. The lust of the flesh is also one of the foes that we fight, all those. We must be on alert for temptation. Secondly, we must be on alert for temptation. Keep watching and praying, Jesus said, that you may not come into temptation. If you are not watching, husband, father, and seeking the Lord's help in prayer, we often will not even notice temptation when it comes. When our spiritual eyes are shut or sleepy, we can fall more easily into sin. When was the last time, Dad, that you got on your knees on your bed and wept over your unsaved children? When was the last time that you prayed with your wife? When was the last time you prayed with your children? Are you watching and praying over your family? Do they see you, Dad, as a man of prayer? Or do they see one who just says, go ahead and pray. Go ahead and read your Bible, but you don't do those things. Third thing to watch for, fathers, is men, and church. We must watch for apathy and indifference. The very nature of those sins makes them hard to notice. By definition, a person who is apathetic and indifferent is it's insensitive and therefore cannot be alert to it. Christians cannot dis disregard the Lord's word. We cannot. We can't neglect Scripture. To neglect Scripture is to disregard it and treat it as if it means nothing. When God 
sent his son to die on that cross. And you and I who are brothers and sisters in Christ, we are brothers and sisters in Christ because one day God opened our eyes just as he did Paul's. And we were blind, but then we saw. We saw our own sin. We saw our filthiness before a holy God. And God convicted us of the sin. We declared ourselves guilty before a holy God and wept for his mercy. And he gave it to us in the form of his son who came and died on that cross and took our place for that sin that we deserve to go to hell for. And when Jesus did that and he suffered and died, he rose again on the third day and sits at the right hand of the Father. And we who have confessed with our mouth and believe in our hearts that Jesus is God's son, the Bible tells us we're his and we're saved and we belong to him and nothing can snatch us out of his hands. But do you live like that? Do you li he is the word that, that became alive to us. Do you, do you strive to know him by picking up the book and reading about the man who was God incarnate? 100% God and 100% man, and he came and because he loved me. Because he loved me. He died for me. Why wouldn't I want to know everything about him? Have you ever done anything for somebody and, and, and something really, uh, it, it took a lot of effort on your part, a lot of time on your part, a lot of energy, a lot of money, and they said, hey, thanks, and you never hear another word from them. Never. Nothing. And you're like, well, I didn't do it for that, but at least you could show some gratitude. Christian, we are that spoiled kid sometimes. God, give me this. And I promise I won't ask for anything else. How many of y'all heard that as a daddy? If you just buy me this, Dad, I will never ask you again. <laughs> Liar. And as you get it, and then you get it, and you get it, it's just like, it's the same way with us. Give me, give me, give me, give me, give me, God, instead of saying, God, I'm yours. Use me up for your glory. Help me be more like you. I'm not perfect by any stretch of the imagination. Help me be a better dad. Help me to be a better husband. Help me to be a better man. Help me to be a better Christian. Christian. Hmm. You see, when we neglect scripture, scripture is to disregard it and count it as nothing. Before long, we can't even remember what we have received and heard, and the Lord's way becomes more and more vague and unclear. Would God really mean that? Did God really say that? When his word is unsure to us, we become indifferent to it. Fourth thing you need to be cautious of, men and Christian, is Christians should be alert for false teachers about whom the New Testament gives many warnings. And we're spending time in Galatians where Paul is, is just, he can't believe that only after a year and a half he, he's gone from the Galatian church that he established that they're deserting the faith. We have to be on guard. Husbands, fathers, you need to be on guard. Who is teaching your children and what are they teaching them? Second Peter, there were also false teachers among you who will secretly introduce destructive heresies, even denying the master who brought them. Second Peter chapter 2, verse 1. The fourth thing to be alert on are negative uh, negative. Indicating things where we are commonly to watch for in order to avoid because they will harm us too. When, when things that are coming into your family's life, are you alert to that? Are you cautious of what your children are coming home saying? Who they're hanging around with? What's, what's going on? But the New Testament also gives us some positive things to watch for, some things that will strengthen to help us. Jesus tells us to watch and pray in order to escape temptation. How, men, when was the last time when you had a lustful thought that the first thing you did was go to a scripture verse that you memorized? The problem with too many of us is we haven't memorized scripture. But in the dead of night, when those thoughts come to you that shouldn't be coming to a Christian man and you start to yield to that temptation, do you go to Romans 6? And do you say, what shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? Certainly not. How shall we who died to sin live any longer in it? You see, knowing God's word is a great way to fight temptation. 
Prayer strengthens us in God's way just as it protects us against Satan's way. Peter's not simply uh, saying a random ritual in which faithful Christians are to, to pr- participate dutifully and just repeat a prayer. I grew up in a religion like that where you just repeat the same prayer over and over and over and over again. It meant nothing. Prayer is not simply a ritual. It is pouring your heart out to God, the one who created you. Do you understand that you have access to the throne of glory? That God who created the heavens and earth looks down on you. I, I, there's an awesome video out there, and I will encourage you all to watch it. It's titled, Where Were You? by Gosia. It's a fascinating, fascinating music video. Now, I was corrected this week. It told me it really isn't a, it really isn't a song because there's no melody in it. I don't know what that is, so it will sound like it's a song to me. But I'm encouraging you to watch that today. And what it, re- it, it, it starts off, and, it, and, and whoever produces it, this, this people got talent. That's all I got to say. And it starts off, and it's the words of Job. And, and it shows Job in a black screen with white words on it. And then it says, God answered him. And the screen comes alive with a picture of the universe and the earth and the oceans and the mountains. And it's got... This, this guy is singing as if he, he's, he's repeating the words from Job 48. And I, I watched that and I wept. I wept. I'm a visual guy. And I'm a guy that gets emotional real easy. But watching that and realizing who God is. And watching this simply displayed before my eyes as way I can understand it. And seeing that God, and you know how the song answer, it finishes? It, it has this man, Job, talking. It has God, and the, and the singer raises his voice to this climatic conclusion. And at the very end, he says, but God, listen to me. Oh, he listens to you. He listens to you, the God who created heaven and earth. He gives you his word so that you can hear him speak to you. He allows us the intimacy of going to him to call him Abba Father, to, to, to lay your cares and your concerns before him. And men, we run away from it. Instead of going to the one where all our source for everything that we need to live a life holy and pleasing to him, to live a life, you're not going to be a perfect dad. And some of you in here today, like me, have failed in some areas of your uh, life as a parent. God is faithful and just and has forgiven, forgiven us for that. But think about how you're going to respond from this day forward, Dad. How are you? See, Christians should always be watching for the, we're, we're told to watch for the Lord's return as well. That's another positive thing. Watch. Be watchful. Be watchful for his return. The two great motives we have for living faithful for Christ are remembering what he did for us on the cross and looking forward to his coming again in Matthew chapter 24 verse 42 therefore be on alert for you do not know which day your Lord is coming Jesus said to them I'm coming back but the day of the Lord will come like a thief Peter says therefore what sort of people ought to you to be in holy conduct and godliness looking for and hastening the coming day of God we do everything we can to hope it doesn't come Instead of praying that it will come and instructing our children about who God is. Fathers, you're to be watchful. Fathers, you're to stand firm and in the faith. David, nearing his death of his son, oh, excuse me, uh, his death, spoke to his son Solomon about standing in faith. David's time to die had was coming to a close, we're told. And in 1 Kings chapter 2, verse 1, we read these words. Then King, then David's time to draw near, so he commanded Solomon, his son, saying, I am going the way of all the earth. So you shall be strong and be a man. And you shall keep the responsibility given by Yahweh, your God, to walk in his ways 
to keep his statutes, his commandments, his judgments, his testimonies, according to what is written in the law of Moses, that you may be prosperous in all that you do and wherever you turn, so that Yahweh may establish his promise, which he spoke concerning me, saying, If your sons keep their way to walk before me in truth with all their heart, with all their soul, he said, You shall not have a man cut off from the throne of Israel. First Kings chapter 2, verse 1 through 4. Now, this was a promise pertaining to David and Solomon, but it has application for us men, Christians. Walk in his ways. Are you walking in the ways of the Lord? Or are you walking in your own, what's, what's right in your own sight? Stand fast, stand firm appears eight times in the New Testament. Stand firm, men. The orig- in the original Greek, the term means to hold one's ground, maintain a position, be steadfast, remain upright, persist, persevere, and don't give up. Hold the wall. Hold the wall. Do not give ground, men. You're called to be that watchman in your family. You're told to stand fast and stand firm. When others would waver, Christian, you do not. When others would turn from God, you do not. When others would turn to the world, you stand fast. You stand firm. You hold the line. And how do we do this? How do we stand fast? We stand fast in the faith by studying God's word and not wavering in the truth of the gospel. Paul tells the church in Thessalonica, So then, brothers, stand firm and hold to the traditions which you were taught, whether by word of mouth or by letter from us. Christian, you have been instructed in the ways of God through the preaching of the word, as you come on Sunday mornings to worship your Savior. I pray to be encouraged, to be uplifted, to be challenged and be corrected when necessary. You come and you study what Pastor Mark says from the pulpit. Is he speaking God's truth? You're Bereans, and you go and you study God's word, and you validate what is preached to you from this pulpit, and then you strive to live that. You go to Sunday school, and you ask questions of the teacher, and you discuss it with each other. You come to Monday night men's group, and you have open discussion about things in a smaller environment and talk about things in the life of men. You're engaged. You serve alongside one another. It's about being with the body of Christ so that you are standing fast and you realize you're not alone. Men, one of the I, I, I get a thrill every time I see one of these movies, whether it's a, it's a movie that, dis, that displays ancient Rome or Vikings, and, and you see the men when they form a shield wall. And they lay those shields one on top of each other. Not one man standing alone to fight 20 men, but 20 men who put shields in front of one another and their axes or their swords out. Or the Roman legionnaires who would line up in their legions, in their cohorts, in their centuries, And they would line up, and they would look like one fighting unit. Each shield would guard the man's right side to the left of that legionnaire, knowing that that man would protect them. Christian, we're there to protect one another. God is our strength, but he gives us one another to be there for one another, to hold each other's arms up. The problem with us men is we don't want to be seen as weak at all and we don't want to share our our failures and our hurts with one another but that's exactly what we should be doing exactly what we should be doing timothy we must work hard and do our best to present ourselves to god he says as one approved a worker who does not need to be ashamed and who correctly handles the word of truth dad do you know how to handle the word of truth is this some mystery to you do you go go see your mom Or do you expect mom to teach them the Bible and you not to teach them the Bible? Do you expect Pastor Brian to do it or one of the other faithful men that serve along him with the youth or for our our WANA program? And, well, they're getting it from them. They don't need it from me. All that does is validate what you should be teaching them at home. We should strive to know and understand what we believe and, most importantly, know the one in whom we have believed it. For this reason, I also suffer these things, but I am not ashamed. 
For I know whom I have believed, and I am convinced that he is able to guard what I have entrusted to him until this day. Hold to the standard of sound words which you have heard from me in the faith and love which are in Christ Jesus. Guard through the Holy Spirit who dwells in us the treasure which has been entrusted to you. That's Paul writing to Timothy, his last letter ever written. Encouraging this young man in the faith. Fathers, for this reason... I also suffer these things, but I am not ashamed, for I know whom I have believed, and I am convinced that he is able to guard what I have entrusted him until this day. Stand firm in God's promises for you. They can take your life, believer. They cannot take your soul. It belongs to God, and you will be his forever and ever and ever. When this life that we live now, when a billion years have passed, there will be another billion and another billion and another billion without end of time. This is nothing but a, not even a twinkle. And yet, we live our lives thinking this is all there is. And we're commanded to focus on the one who saved us. Live the time that God has given you here on this earth. Christian, He's given you today, not tomorrow. Today is all we have. Everyone in this room who's alive right now breathing, this is all that God gives us is this day. We pray that we can live tomorrow. We pray that we can live for years to come. And for some of you, I pray that you live 60, 70, 80 more years, these young people in here. Me, don't be praying for that. I want to be used up for God. My calling in my life right now is to be his man, to preach his word, to teach his word, to shepherd this flock, to die for you if necessary, to love my wife, to be her husband, to love her as Christ loved the church, to be a grandfather, an influence in my grandchildren's life, to be a father who my children seek for counsel. But my main focus is not this life. I'm going to do all that till I die, and then somebody else will take my place here in the pulpit. Someone will take your place. But are you living this life for the one who saved you? We stand fast in the faith by staying in fellowship with other believers. We stand fast in the faith by depending on God who establishes, enables, and anoints us to stand firm for Christ and, and hold firmly to the faith we profess. Paul wrote to the Corinthians, You see, we can't do this on our own. I I can't be a lone wolf and do all this. It's just not going to happen. I'm weak. I'm very weak. And I need Christ. I need my fellow believers to stand firm with me and encouraging encouraging me. You know, last week was, was, I was weak and in need. And the body lifted me up. I have had such a great week in the Lord this week. Thank you, church, for praying for me. Thank you. I, it was, a, it was The difference between this week and last week was night and day. I was weak and needy and needing God for all, everything and all my strength. And God was merciful and gracious and answered your prayers. We need one another. God, by div- God's divine power, he gives us everything we need for living a godly life. Instead of shrinking back, men are turning away from Christ in challenging times. We hold unswaveringly to the hope we profess, for he who promised is faithful, the writer of Hebrews said in chapter 10, verse 23. Hold unswervingly to the hope we possess, for he who promised is faithful. God is our guarantee. He is the one that said he will keep us. He will sustain us. You will persevere to the end because you are his. In our own strength, we are powerless. In Christ, we can do all things. That's what the verse means. I can't do anything in my own. I'm worthless. Oh, I may do things as far as the world is concerned, but the things because of Christ, I can do nothing. But I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me to work for him, to suffer persecution. That's what Paul was talking about. When persecution come, when they mock you. I had somebody ask me from the earlier service, Pastor, I need some counsel. And he was talking about 
what's going on at his place of employment with the LGBTQ uh, plus Pride Month. How was he to respond? What was he supposed to do? It, it was vexing him to his very soul about, about his faith. And one of the things I remind him, you don't think the first century Christians dealt with stuff like that? Imagine the streets of Rome and you were a Christian and you saw the debauchery that went on in the streets of Corinth or Ephesus. It, God didn't tell them to go burn any temples down. What did he do? Live for Christ. Proclaim the gospel. Live for Christ. Proclaim the gospel. Share it in love. Truth in love, Christian. Not degrading talk. Not trying to humiliate or embarrass somebody that doesn't, doesn't agree with everything we have to say. But you share that. Do you really care enough of that person that you're offended by? To say, hey, can I buy you lunch today? Can I, can, I, can I share something with you? Can I share it with you, the person who means everything to me? And I care enough about you to share this with you. And, and, and you could be so bold to say, you're not going to like what I got to say. But I care enough to tell you it about the one who saved me. Because my sin was just as depraved as anybody else's sin. Get off our high horses, folks, and proclaim the gospel to a lost and dying world. That's how we can do all things. Be watchful, stand firm, act like men. The basic idea is to behave like a man, not a child. When I became a man, I put my childish ways. Shame on you if you're spending hours a day playing video games, men. Shame on you. Put things away that are childlike. Now, you want to set a time that you're playing and it's, that's what you do for your entertainment instead of going fishing? I get it. But when I have a wife that comes to me and says, I can't do anything with my husband. He won't come to church. He won't serve. He won't do anything because all he does is he comes home from work and he'll spend six hours on a video game. Guilty. My son, Joshua, here today, what a blessing it is to have him, um, he, will tell, he, he would wake up to try to play the game I was on at 3 o'clock in the morning. I, Kathy used to complain and say, well, you're on the game way too much. And I would say, well, honey, you gotta, I got to chill. I got to relax. Well, she understood that for an hour. She didn't understand it for six hours. And then, and then I try to justify it. Well, I'm not out there hunting or fishing. I'm not riding a boat somewhere. I'm not buying all that stuff. It's pretty cheap. I mean, I spent 50 bucks. It's giving me all this entertainment it's giving me. I ain't buying guns or any of that stuff. And then I tried to, then, I, then what I did was I'd only do it on the weekends, and I wouldn't do it. So we would do whatever we were doing on Friday night, and she'd go to bed, I'd go to bed, and then I'd get up. And I spent all night playing a video game. Go to bed 4 or 5 o'clock in the morning and then get up at 8 o'clock to be with my wife. Shame on me. That's why I can point the finger at you because I pointed at me. Shame on us. Shame on us if we have things in our life that occupy our time that children should be playing. A godly man has a sense of control, confidence, and courage that the immature or childish person does not have. To know what a true man is, we need look no further than the life of Jesus Christ. As the son of man, Jesus is the epitome of manhood, the perfect example of what true maturity looks like. Jesus was full of the Holy Spirit and lived in complete dependence on and obedience to the will of God. Jesus Christ, God incarnate, the son of the living God, who came to this earth, was born of a virgin, lived a holy life, yielded to God the Father. How much more should we be yielding to the will of God? How do we know his will? We have the book. 
He tells us how we live our lives. Christian, I've said this, but it's always worth repeating because there's always new people to hear it. You stress too much about what the will of God is in your life. One, if you're a believer. Two, are you obedient, Christian? Three, are you in any kind of sin that you are have uh, 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 practicing sin that you are not repented of? If you're doing those, if you're a Christian, if you're obeying God, if you're not in habitual sin, guess what? Anything you do is in the will of God. It's not that hard. God will, as you, as you start to move in a direction and you're going, and you move in that direction. When I've, I've said this before, when, when Grace Harvest started and it all went, it just kind of went. There was, it, was just, it just seemed like it was easy. Oh, don't tell me the, I'm not telling you it wasn't hard work. I don't mean that. But it wasn't like we were, we were struggling to make this succeed. We were just obedient. We were in the will of God. Fathers, are, are you striving to, to live a life that reflects the will of God in your life? That's what Jesus did. Jesus was full of the Holy Spirit and lived in complete dependence on the obedience to do God's will. You are filled with the Holy Spirit. Christian, you are filled with the Holy Spirit. You as a born-again believer have God living inside of you. Greater is he that is in me than, than he who is in the world. You have no, you have no re reason to fear Satan. You belong to the king. I, I always think of that. And I remember one illustration. It's, it's almost like it, you've, got this, you've got this big, big, burly man with a sword in his hand and and then you got this little teeny chihuahua over here and it's little teeny chihuahua is barking at this man like he's going to do something to him it's like us worrying about satan sometimes when we got the holy spirit indwelling in us nothing is going to do you do you understand christian nothing is going to happen to you outside of the will of god nothing if you are not in sin, now there's things that happen when, when, when you commit sin. You take illicit drugs and you have an overdose. That's a consequence of sin. You're sexually impure and promiscuous and you get a disease that kills you. That's on you. But I can sit in my life and say now that if, if something happens to me, Blessed be the name of the Lord. He gives, he takes away. Blessed be his name. It's because we have Christ in us and we should seek to serve him and to love him and be obedient to him. Act like men, act like Christian men. A Christian man is obedient to the Father's will and is about the Father's business. We should be about God's business. Your children should see you, Dad, as somebody who loves them, loves their mother, but loves God most of all. Loves God most of all. Like Christ, the godly man will shun sin and follow after righteousness. He will, in the power of the Spirit, seek to keep God's law and live in God's will. Not man's law, not man's will, but God's will. He will endure opposition and never lose heart, the writer of Hebrews tells us. He will be a man of the Word, the Bible using scripture, scripture to overcome temptation. He will be a man of prayer. He will be a man of love and sacrifice. It's not a description of what the world signifies as a man, but that's what a godly man is. A godly man raises children that his daughter can look at her, her father and say, when I marry a man, he don't need to be like daddy. But he needs to love me like my daddy loves my mama. He needs to be a man of self-control. He needs to be a man that's firm but yet loving. He needs to be a man that loves Jesus more than he even loved my own mother. You see, that's men. That should be our desire and our goal. A godly man is vigilant against danger. He's faithful to the truth, brave in the face of opposition, persistent through trials, and above all, he's loving. 
Men, we are not to be mean to our wives. We are not to speak ill of our wives. We are not to degrade our wives. Another thing, men, is, is I, I have walked through many of you men with, with me on this journey as we've gone through The Measure of a Man, and, and I always it's a great book to have. If you guys have not gone through it yourself, I would recommend it for you. Measure of a Man, it lists the, the requirements for deacons and elders, but it pertains, basically the author says this is for every Christian man. You should be able to say that these are the qualities and quantities I want in my life, and women, the same thing except for the obvious of being a teacher to men. But here, listen to what this says. An overseer, an elder, then must be above reproach. Every one of us should be above reproach. Every one of us. Your word should be your word. Your yes should be your yes. Your no should be your no. The husband of one wife, temperate, sensible, respectable, hospitable, able to teach, not addicted to wine or pugnacious, but considerate. Peaceable, free from the love of money, leading his own household well, having his children in submission with all dignity, and he must have a good reputation with those outside the church so that he will not fall into reproach and the snare of the devil. Every one of us should strive for that. It's not for the preacher, just him alone. It's not for the elders alone. It's not for the Sunday school teachers alone. It's for all of us as Christians to live a life that reflects the one we belong to. A true man knows what's right and stands firm in the right. A true man is a godly man. He loves the Lord. He loves his wife. He loves his children. He loves those that the Lord has entrusted to his care. And finally, we, we're told to be strong. Some men think that being a man means bench pressing 300 pounds or dunking a basketball or killing a bear with your bare hands. 1 Corinthians 10, 12 says, Therefore, let him who thinks he stands take heed, lest he fall. Godly men admit their own weaknesses and are strong in the spirit. You know, one thing about your pastor, you're going to learn how flawed he is. Remember years ago, somebody came up to me and told me, he said, I could never be a member of this church as a visitor. He said, I could never be a member of this church. And I said, why? He said, because I don't want my pastor ever revealing any of his faults. Well, I went, Okay. Can you show me in Scripture where that happens, where none of the writers of the New Testament shared their own sins and failures? It's amazing what we think a real man is. See, a real man is willing to admit when he's wrong, but he corrects that wrong. That's what he does. He corrects it. He doesn't stay in it. You never hear this man tell you a story where I glamorized sin and stayed in it. It's always where God has convicted me and changed my heart to make him oh I have such a long way to go to be like him but it's a it's a struggle it's a battle and it's a road that I will be on until the day I die but just like any football player who plays on Friday night puts his hand on that football catches that pass receives that punt or kickoff he's not going to score a touchdown every time but that's in his head Running for the goalpost. I'm gonna, and he does it. Does he quit and go throw the football down? This is stupid. I'm not doing this again. No, he gets up. He goes back in the huddle, demands the ball, give it to me again, runs down the field, gets knocked to the ground, gets up until he scores. And Christian, our life should be similar to that. You're not going to be successful every time you go to do something for the Lord. You're not going to live. You're not going to be that perfect husband. You're not going to be that perfect father. But you admit when you're wrong. You pick yourself up. Repent of it. Apologize to your children if you need to. Apologize to your wife if you need to. You pick up that ball. You get back in the huddle. You get back on the field. And you live for Christ. Each and every day. Be strong. Godly men admit their own weaknesses. Jesus not give us strength. He is our strength. That's the difference. We're not given strength. He is our strength. We all have weaknesses. It's not a sin to be tempted. Sin is when you yield to that temptation. Be strong in the face of it. We have to be strong. The devil knows what Delilah to send your way. 
He knows. He knows your weaknesses. Your weaknesses may not be the same as my weaknesses. He doesn't attack you the same way he attacks me. Godly men exercise self-control by being under the Spirit's control. Only a strong spirit can successfully battle and overcome the flesh. Paul told the Corinthians, for you are still fleshly. For since there is jealousy and strife among you, are you not fleshly? And are you not walking like mere men? 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 3. Yet, yet they had decided, uh, excuse me, they had deceived themselves into thinking they were wise and strong. In chapter 3, verse 18 of 1 Corinthians. If any man among you thinks he is wise in this age, let him become foolish that he may become wise. The apostle says of them sarcastically, we are fools for Christ, Paul says. We are fools for Christ's sake, but we are prudent in Christ. We are weak, but we are strong. Because of their spiritual weakness, the church in Corinth despised and profaned the most sacred of things, including the Lord's Supper, which, which they were chastened for, where they became weak and sick, and a number of them died. See, the person who thinks he is strong in himself is in the greatest danger of falling. Be strong. Be on guard. Christian, father, husband, man, to be strong, you must be watchful. To be strong, you must stand firm. To be strong, act like godly men. Every head bowed, every eye closed. If you're like me, men, when I wrote this sermon and preached this sermon and studied this sermon and prayed over this sermon, I realized how short I have fallen. Oh, I wish I could tell you I was the perfect dad for my children. I wasn't. I wish I could tell you I've been the perfect husband for my wife. I have not been. And I certainly haven't been the perfect shepherd. And yet, in all these things, God has chosen me to be a father, to be a husband to be a shepherd and the key to doing all three of those is to acknowledge the weakness in our own flesh repent of the sin in our lives and strive to live for him that's what I did when I preached this sermon to myself I pray that it's a similar result in you but I want to encourage you this morning men I want to encourage you to act like men, no matter how the world will tell you what their perception of a man is. One day, all the accolades and trophies and awards that you've received from the world will mean nothing. And the praise of the one who called you to be his will mean everything. What say you men this morning? Do you spend more time on your hobbies than you do with your children? Do you spend more time in front of a TV set than you do in the Word of God? Do you spend more time with your friends than you do your wife? I encourage you to be men. Be godly men. Be watchful. Stand firm. Act like men. And to you, dear one, today, who are not a father... If you're a woman here today, these same things I preached on apply to you as well in a general sense. And I pray this morning that if God has convicted you, that you get that straight with him this morning. He's given you this day to live. Strive to live for him this day and every day that he gives you in the future. In just a moment, I will stand up front in front of you, God's people. And if God has declared to you that this is the place that he wants you to come and to serve him, then you come and grab this preacher by the hand and you tell me this is the place that God has placed you. God has called you to faith in him this very hour. I pray that you make that decision public. You come, you grab this preacher by the hand, and you say, Preacher, I don't know what this is all about, but I know I'm a sinner in need of a Savior. And I trust in Christ for that salvation and not my own works. 
and you come, you let me know. And some of you, God may be working your way. I can't even begin to imagine today. If you want me to pray with you, I'll be up front. However God leads, you come. You come as he leads. It's not a time of manipulation. It's time for us to reveal our hearts to, to God. Father, thank you. Thank you for your word. Thank you for your people. Thank you for the mercy and grace that we do not deserve. And I pray your will is done in my life and the life of your people here at Grace Harvest. And I ask all this in the precious name of your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. You come as the Lord leads, Pastor Kyle leads us in song. Let's all stand and sing.